Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for Behavioral Science Statistics, and in it, we're looking at the second online quiz for Chapter 12, which is about the chi-squared test. The first question on this quiz is, what is the null hypothesis for the chi-squared test for independence? And the choices are A, each group's frequencies will be distributed uniformly across all categories, or B, each group on the predictor variable, or IV, will have identical proportions in each category on the outcome variable, or DV. Or C, the mean of group 1 is the same as the mean of group 2. Or D, the distribution of frequencies on the outcome variable will match a hypothesized pattern. Well, we're looking at the chi-square test for independence, which means we have two categorical variables. One is being used as a predictor of the second. And so the long one here is, in fact, the correct answer in this case. Let me just mention, um, version uh, answer A could be the null hypothesis for the goodness of fit test where you have a single categorical variable as long as you are hypothesizing a uniform distribution. Similarly, D could be the null hypothesis for the goodness of fit test if you have a particular different pattern other than uniform that you're expecting. Um, C is uh, the null hypothesis for the two sample T test. Um, here I've just copied the null and the alternate alternative hypotheses straight from the presentation. And the, there's, so there's a longer way, a more verbose way, and there's a, there's a more succinct way of, of expressing the, the both of them. Um, again, these are basically equivalent statements. Um, each group on the predictor variable, or IV, will have identical proportions in each category on the outcome variable, or DV. That's correct. It is also fair to say the distribution of observations is independent of the two variables. Two different ways of saying the same thing. Both of those represent the null hypothesis for the chi-squared test for independence. Number two, what is the minimum level of measurement required for either of the chi-squared tests? Interval, ordinal, nominal, or ratio? Well, it's nominal. It's, it's the lowest version of our level of measurement that only indicates the category that the observation is in. And you can tell that because right here, this is the actual formula for chi-squared. The O and the E stand for observed frequencies and expected frequencies. And in order to get a frequency, how common a score is, you can get that with any of the four levels, including nominal. Um, you actually usually do this one with nominal or maybe ordinal, um, but you can do it with any of them. All you have to know is the frequency, the observed or expected frequency of, the, of each uh, category or score. Number three, which inferential test does not require a degrees of freedom calculation? So we've got a negative here. And the uh, choices are t-test, chi-squared, ANOVA, or z-test. Well, the one that does not require uh, degrees of freedom is the z-test. Uh, let's take a quick look here. There's the z formula on the side. And you see we get the sample mean minus the population mean mu. And we divide by the standard error, which does not involve a degrees of freedom. It, it's the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Um, on the right, on the other hand, we have a whole bunch of different degrees of freedoms. Uh, the DFN minus one, that's used in the one sample T test. Uh, that's used for each sample in the two sample T test. That's, um, and then we have DF is equal to N minus K minus one. That is one of the degrees of freedom in the analysis of variance. DFK minus one, that is the other degrees of freedom in the analysis of variance. It's also the degrees of freedom for the uh, chi-square goodness of fit test. Um, we have DF is equal to C minus one times R minus one. That's the degrees of freedom for the chi-square test for independence, where that's the number of columns and the number of rows. Next one, the word independence in the chi-squared test for independence means a, the experimenter has control over which categories people are assigned to on the predictor or independent variable. B, the distribution of frequencies on the outcome or dependent variable is unrelated to the categories of the predictor or independent variable. C, frequencies are distributed at random across categories of the outcome or dependent variable. And D, it is impossible to predict the distribution of scores on the outcome or dependent variable. Long wordy sentences, it's a lot to get through, but I do have to be particular about the way these things are phrased. The answer is B, that the independence, and the test for independence means that the distribution of frequencies on the outcome variable is unrelated to the categories of the predictor variable. Um, all right. And just this is just an example of when you would use independence here. And what we're trying to do here, actually what we have here, uh, is independence, that 
I uh, have these observed values. I got a chi-square of 3.38. That's less than the critical value of 7.81. And so I've concluded that the distribution of academic scholarships does not differ uh, for men and women across sports. You know, you can see that there's differences, but it does not differ significantly for the uh, given the observations that we have. So we retain the null hypothesis in this point. All right, number five. If a researcher conducts a chi-square test for independence using an alpha of 0.5 and gets an observed p-value of 0.4, then she should reject the null hypothesis, should retain or fail to reject the null hypothesis, has proven that the null hypothesis is false, has proven that the alternative hypothesis is true. Well, in this case, remember we had one before where the alpha was 0.1 and the observed p-value was 0.4, and in that case we retained the null hypothesis because uh, our observed p-value was bigger than our alpha value, or, or our, sort of our criterion. But if you're using a different criterion of 0.5, then the 0.4 actually represents a statistically significant finding, and you should reject the null hypothesis. Now, it's not that in one case there's a difference, in the other case there isn't. It's all about the criterion that you're using. Say, if we use 0.5 as our cutoff, yeah, we're past that. But if we use 0.1 as our cutoff, no, we're not past that. Um, the B would be if we had a non-significant finding. That's what we had previously. Now, let me just say a quick thing about C and D, um, where we've proven that the null is false or we've proven the alternate is true. Please do not use these terms. In statistics, things are a little squishy, and it's just never correct to say that we have proven or disproven something. The data either are consistent with it or inconsistent with it, or the data are likely given a particular hypothesis or, or whatnot, but watch out for the word proved. Very loaded. Um, and again, here's our situation where this time we have rejected the null hypothesis because now we got our little cutoff there of 6.251, but our observed value given by the dot is on the far side. It's in the shaded region of rejection, so we would reject the null hypothesis. Anyhow, that's it for the second quiz, and I'll see you in a moment for quiz number three.